Good day folks, Ashley here again in Ancient Origins Facebook Live Friday segment. I'm just going to give it a 20-30 seconds for people to log in. It seems to be the case that it's about a minute in that people start to log in. So if you're watching already, let me know where you're watching from and you can share this feature with anybody else that you think might be interested. We're going to be discussing the secrets of the Atlantic Brochs. So let's get started. What is a broch? Well, a broch, by definition, is a complex Atlantic roundhouse. It's a dwelling house, is what it's believed to be, of the ancient Scots. Now, the Royal Commission for Historic and Ancient Monuments in Scotland claim there's almost 600, 571 brochs in Scotland from the Western Isles, ranging up to Shetland, and some as low, far south as the southwest coast of Scotland. However, the concentration of Atlantic brochs is in Caithness, at the centre of the Atlantic region of northern Scotland. There's almost 200 in Caithness alone. So, nobody's actually quite sure what a broch is. Some archaeologists claim it's a dwelling house for the richer people within societies, where they had a dominant structure overlooking the surrounding farmlands. Others believe they were built by a swathe of immigrants from the north east coast of England. And others believe that you know, the name is an indication. The word broch is from the southeast of Scotland word broth, meaning fort. So everything that you can see in a broch indicates that they were defensive structures, but they were so much more. And that's exactly what Ian McLean from the Caithness Broch Project and myself set out to prove. So... What we did was plot the location of four brochs in Caithness up the Strath of Berrydale, just as you pass the Caithness border. Both Ian and I independently over the last 10 or 15 years had suspected that brochs were possibly lookout towers, where a coastal located broch, seeing a ship appear in the horizon, could raise a flag and send a message inland up two or three miles within minutes enabling an entire community to lock down upon attack. So how did we prove this theory? What we did was we went to Berrydale, to the beach in Berrydale in Caithness. Now the location of Berrydale Castle today is built on top of what's believed to be an ancient broch site. So that was the first broch in our chain, the, the lookout broch if you like, the one that's watching over the North Sea. So we drove further up the strath and we inserted a sighting pole at a broch called Rinsery and then moved three miles further up to see if we could backsight that pole, and we could. So we established that from the coast you could send a message about one mile to the first broch, Rinsery, and then another two miles further up the broch. So we'd established that yes, communication could be undertaken. However, two miles further up that strath is the broch of Anne Dunn, and absolute superstructure crumbled down now but the the location of Andon Broch commands a view over the entire landscape all the way to the sea. So Ian hiked me all the way up to Andon Broch and we got there. We looked back and we could see the sighting pole at the mid Broch. We could almost see the one down at Rinsery but it was too distant but being able to see the third sighting pole established that our, sus our suspicions were correct you could, whether it was used or not to do this is another question, but you could send a signal from one broch to another and pass a message using a flag, using some other kind of sighting device um, within minutes. And in, you know that whole Berrydale Strath could lock down. So we kind of did, we experimented and proved that that could happen. But where this is going to go now is next summer, we're going to have to go up two more straths, you know, because taking one strath and finding that this communication system works means that it works in that strath. It's not a big enough section for us to say that it's a system or a, or a, a building dynamic across all of the brochs. So, back on to the project, the Caithness Broch Bro Bro Project. The reason we did this documentary was to try and raise awareness and support for what is an absolutely brave undertaking. Caithness Broch Project intend to rebuild a broch in Caithness making one of Scotland's most fascinating and newest tourist attractions. The goal is quite simple, as Ian lays out at the end of our documentary. We want to create a feature in Caithness that's going to highlight this, the Iron Age 
archaeology of Caithness, of which there's more than anywhere else in Scotland, with the prime goal of stopping people getting on that ferry terminal to Orkney. Orkney, north of Caithness, is a hub of ancient archaeology, and there's a great saying, Donald Oman, the local wick um, historian, said, Orkney likes to wear her jewels around her neck, where Caithness keeps hers in her pocket. And it's so true, but it's time for us to get our jewels out of our pocket and get them out there for people to see. Caithness is a centre of Iron Age activity, but it's pretty much untouched. So what the Caithness Project are doing is bringing alive the Iron Age culture of Caithness. And what's really good is 2017, 2018 is going to see a massive interest in television shows and movies about the Iron Age so let's get Caithness on the map with a massive new tourist facility, a living, working broch. It's an audacious task, but, you know, let's do everything we can to support it. Go to the Caithness Broch Project's website, join them on Facebook, like them up, like our videos, support everything we're doing. Ian McLean and his partner Kenny are driving this project. Two guys, passion unbound. There's very little money to be made in this. It is an absolute heritage project. So, I have rattled on enough, I think, about brochs. Um, I'm seeing a few questions coming in here which I'll attempt to answer. What can I see? The west brochs are squared and stepped. Right, Don. The southwestern Scottish brochs are different from the northeast of Scotland brochs. What we have with brochs is they're all circular. But the diameters within can range anything between 5 metres to 15 metres. And there's, albeit this, they're circular, that's the only common point they have. They do have double walls with gaps in between, which Ian believes are, you know, possibly to dry grain. So the chief of the kingdom, the chief of the landscape could have the grain storage within his battlement, within his walls, if you like. But what we see is stylizing, local independent stylizing within the pottery that's found in Brox. There's no common theme as such. So it is wrong to say the Brox in Scotland were all built by a common culture. There was the, 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 the template, if you like, the idea of a roundhouse was common, but all of the stylization, the symbology, the type of pottery was all local. Everything was um, had a local flavor. So there wasn't any common um, culture that built these brochs. Musa in Orkney is one of the best examples. It's completely built. It's not the tallest broch in the world, but it's it's completely formed from the bottom to the top. So go Google Musa in Orkney and you can get a real feel for what these brochs used to look like when they were in um, full power, if you like. But Caithness has almost 200 brochs. You know, Musa always seems, it's the sort of iconic broch, if you like. But, you know, Shetland is at the extreme of the Brock Builders territory. The hub, the focus and the core is in Caithness in the north of Scotland. It has over a third of the Brocks in Scotland. So let's have a look at another question. A newly structured Brock would be superb. Are they found out with Scotland? The answer to that is no. They're found nowhere in the world outside Scotland. Not even in the not you know Scandinavia. There's nothing similar to a brock. It's something that grew independently in Scotland, which leads to the question: Why were they built in the first place? Why around 500 AD did Scottish cultures find a requirement to fortify themselves from what were mud hut round circles? A certain section of archaeologists maintain that it was because we came under attack from the Romans. But as Ian pointed out in the documentary, that just is not the case. The brochs in Scotland, some of them were built 500 AD in the north, 500 BC. The Romans didn't attack till 84 AD, so they're 600 years before the Romans came. Indeed, they would have been used on, and, you know, upon the threat of a Roman attack, but the Romans didn't push north into Caithness. There's no archaeology to suggest the Romans got that far north. So, why were they built? I think they were built because of, as Ian pointed out, climate change. I think things started to get a lot wetter. Agriculture became a bit more testing. And the last of the days of people hunting in the environment to, support, to supplement farming died. We became, in Caithness, a wholly agricultural culture. Everything was agricultural, agricultural and fishing. 
So what we had were permanent residences rather than fishing and hunting stations that people would migrate to throughout the year to meet shoaling fish, to meet herding deer, growing fungus. They had permanent residences and that's what these are. It's the first sort of permanent residences in Scotland. And it's, it's, it's kind of natural to think that these were the inhabitations of the ruling classes within society. But the truth is, these commune, these communities may only have been between 80 and 150 people. So it may not just have been the ruling classes, it could have been the workers that were milling the wheat within the broch. The, of course the chiefs would have been there, but you would have had the people who were drying the wheat, responsible for making sure it didn't sweat too much. You'd have had all the agricultural processes being worked out and maintained from the broch. How many people would fit in one? That's a great argument. We were, a great question, we were looking at Andon Broch, which has about a three meter, four meter diameter. If you were to lie people out and sleep on the floor, I reckon you could get between 20 and 40 people sleeping on the floor of a broch, fire in the center. But I don't think that's what brochs were used for because around brochs you find smaller settlements butting onto the brochs, which would indicate that, that you know, it was a sort of, uh, a higher class of person would work in, inhabit the broch, and all of the, 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 the farming folk, the agriculturalists, the fishermen would have been in the adjoining buildings. What's really sad today is we see all the Highland Clearance villages from the 19th century. Most of those have been rebuilt using the stones from brochs, which is quite um, sad to see. However, that happens throughout the course of time. But when you find a broch, you generally find a clearance village beside it, and it's very obvious that the boulders used to build the clearance villages were used from the brochs. Next question is, how did they fit? Doorways, etc. were so low. That was a little bit of funniness we had in the documentary. I noticed a doorway, it was about three foot high. And I said to Ian there, you know, how high were these people? They were a lot shorter, but they weren't that much shorter. You know, there's a common theory and a common thought in Scottish archaeology and Scottish architecture, ancient, from the Campster Cairns, the old burial cairns from three and 4,000 BC, the doorways are always really low. So there might be some form of ritualistic entry whereby the process of bending down onto one's knees and crawling through a dark space into the light is some form of um, tradition, if you like. You definitely have to do it with every burial cairn, and all of the doors are very, very small, about three foot high in brochs. So that's the esoteric interpretation. Maybe the doors were so small because people had to kneel down. The other one is simple, it's wind. These are placed on the top of hills, on the shoulders of mountains, in, 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 in um, glens where the winds channel up. It could be as simple as draft exclusion. It's far easier to keep the draft out of a 3x3 three three door than it is by a 6x3. So, you know, we might have something there, but it could be an amalgamation of both. It could be a ritualistic process and it could be as practical as draft exclusion. Everybody's telling me to look behind me. What's happening behind me? It may be cats or dogs. Um, so, yeah, great. So let's have a look and see what other questions we have about brochs. I'm in no hurry to get off here today. Hmm. When were the brochs abandoned? I thought the answer to that question was at about two or three hundred AD, four hundred AD. However, Ian McLean informed me that some of the brochs in Shetland were inhabited up to the sixteenth century, and of course they were. If you have a perfectly um, standing broch in an environment, you're going to look. You're going to use that. You're going to live there. The temptation is to strip it and rebuild, but if it's a perfectly standing broch, you're going to inhabit it. So up to the 16th century is the actual answer to that question. Now, Andrew made you look so sorry, had to. That's hilarious. So there was nothing behind me. Nice one, buddy. <laughs> All right, another question coming in here. Campster is unique. Yeah, Campster Cairns. I did a feature on Campster Cairns four months ago. You'll find it there. Um, it's a short six-minute documentary feature. Campster Cairns, you're saying, are unique. They're actually not unique. There was hundreds of similar cairns in Caithness. Campster is, I suppose it is unique in the sense that it's the only one that's been preserved and made into a tourist facility like that. 
but there are bigger and there are more extensive Cairn systems in Caithness. If you go to the area, you know, just south of Thurso, Shebster, a farmer three years ago found over 30 cairns within his land. So there's an, you know, Campster is special because you can actually go there and relive the past. However, there's a lot of flat fields in Caithness with a lot more cairns underneath. So it's not unique as such, but it's, it's mind-blowing. It really is a case of, you, the Campster cairn brings you back 6,000 years in time. So you can actually touch and integrate with the shapes of the buildings, with the the stylizing, you crawl about 30 feet into Campster Cairns and it opens up into a dome inside. And in my documentary feature you can see I recorded myself talking and doing some tunes in there. The acoustic qualities of the inner chamber in these cairns without question was considered by the builders. What I'm thinking myself is that these cairns have a long passage, you know, these passage cairns. And what could be happening is there was drummers, musicians, some kind of auditory specialists within these cairns that were pumping beats out into the surrounding landscape during the festivals and the celebrations. What have we got here? Has Campster been flooded or was it sat in a floodplain? Don, that's super interesting. Cairns you would expect would be on the shoulders of hills and the highlands so they're out of the way of flooding. But they're not. We find so many of them beside rivers. We find so many, many of them in floodplains. But, but, you know, nobody is stupid enough to build anything within a floodplain. So what obviously is the case here, Don, I think, is when they were built, they were built on dry lands. The flooding came later. You know, 6,000 years is a lot of time for environmental change. So I think they were built on dry lands to protect the bones of their ancestors. But over the course of 6,000 years, we find them now in floodplains. And it looks a bit unusual. But there's no way they were originally built in floodplains. Do I have a link for your documentary? I certainly do, but that's going to be really hard for me to, to give to you just now. But if you go to ashleycowie.com, you can see all my featured documentaries up there. You've got stuff in Caithness. There's about four or five I've done in Caithness this year. But if you go to the STV, the Scottish Television Player, you know, we've recorded 76 episodes of the People's History Show in the last year. So there's a lot of short form interviews, a lot of it based in Caithness about our history, the ancient stuff up there all the way through to the mythology, so ashleycowie.com and the STV player. Right, what have we got? What's my involvement in the Keith Nice Brock project? Financially, zip. Um, practically, zip, I don't work for them. Um, how did I get involved? I'll tell you how I got involved. I did a talk in Scrabster at my parents' seafood restaurant last year about the discovery of three heads in Colombia, carved heads on a mountain in Colombia. Ian McLean from the Keith Nesbrock Project helped me out with a projector that night. He came in like a superhero in last minutes to a room of 40 people waiting to watch something that wasn't happening. He completely consumed my thinking processes with his talks on Brock's outside after that talk for half an hour and I knew I was going to come back to Caithness and do that with him so I did it two months ago. We went, threw a couple of cameras over our shoulder and just went out there and filmed and the reason I did that is because I am 100% behind anybody or any organisation that is passionately trying to reinsert the heritage of Caithness or Scotland with their own hands for no financial reward or very little financial reward this is pure passion that's getting pumped out of the Keith Ness Brock project and I align with things like that. I'm not here for a very long time. And what I do with my time is so important to me and that is supporting people who are actually supporting heritage. It's as simple as that. Can you tell us about Lord? Not in this conversation, we'll do that on Christmas Day. In fact, I've got a special in Ancient Origins on the premium member section just before Christmas. It's a half hour feature about Christmas, the history of the Lord and the history of light. So you can tune in there and see that. What else have we got here? There's a lot of talk here about Adrian's wall and the effect of the Romans on the Brock builders. There's no question that when the Romans attacked and drove north to Aberdeenshire and then after the Battle of Mons Gropus in 83 AD, 
that there were Roman forts north of Elgin. There were Roman forts. There's actually evidence of a Roman fort in Dingwall outside Inverness. But a Roman fort with 40 Roman legionnaires is not enough to attack a single broch, never mind threaten the broch structure of Scotland. There's a high, high chance that the Romans, when they invaded Scotland, sent their ships north, sent scouts north, and came back with stories of almost 600 forts, castles, and it possibly perturbed Agricola from driving north. But the true reason the Romans retreated from Scotland after the Battle of Ons Gropis isn't because they feared what lay to the north. They had just defeated every Celtic army in Europe. It's because winter came. Winter came, and he knew if he drove north and got caught up in the messy highlands, he would lose half of his troops, he turned and went back home, believing he had subjugated the UK. Who back home is going to know that he didn't actually conquer the last 60 miles of Scotland? We know it, but Roman historians have it that he subjugated and went off home. So, you know, the Brocks were not built in response to the Romans. The Brocks were there a long time before the Romans came. Let's see if we've got any more questions here. Some skeletons were found in Ohio, USA, but what about the rest of the world? The Brochs don't have much to do with Ohio. However, let's talk about skeletons. When we went down to Ousdale Broch, I found bones in a small um, portal within a window, and of course Ian had discovered these and put them in there. Bones, human bones and animal bones, are very often found within Broch walls. Um, they're found around the doorways and the entrances, so um, Ian from the Broch Project's interpretation of that is that you know, the cult of the dead, ancestor worship was everything. If you think about it, you're living in a world where people are dying on average between 30 and 40 years old. You were working on the fields by the time you were 9 years old and girls were having babies at 13, 14, 15. Survival depended solely on the knowledge one got from ancestors. It's not like today where you can go to the internet, you can go to universities, colleges, schools and source independent knowledge and become a completely independent unit, an indu individuated unit of consciousness separate from your parents. Not back then, everything came from elder. So when an elder died, they were interred into walls, They were. it was a very secret process. So to find bones within the walls, around the doors of rocks, harkens back to the cult of the dead and to ancestor worship. What's really interesting about Caithness, it different to Orkney, is in Orkney, the Culween Cairn, there were 37 Scotty Dog skulls discovered, and the Tomb of the Eagles in Orkney, there were thousands of sea eagle bones discovered, which suggests there was totemic value associated with these brochs, whereby animals were totem, and I believe myself and Scarabray, the totemic animal was whale matter, whale bone, or the whale, there was more whale matter found there than any other type of animal. Um, substance. But in Caithness we don't find that. There doesn't seem to be the same lean on totemic worship or animal worship as there is in Orkney. So there's a definite culture change there where the bond with animal in Orkney, being an island culture I suppose, there's more chance of that. But um, certainly bones are found within the broch walls but what those bones meant were different to the people in Orkney, different to the people in Shetland, different to the people in Caithness. However all kind of related to ancestor worship. Paying respects to the people that keep you alive. Right, let's see what else we got here. Let's not start at Strathnaver, that's on next week, that's on the next part, that's the Strathdon that we're going up next. We're going to go up Strathnaver Strath, Strath, which is on the it's further west in Caithness, and that will be our second sample. We'll try the same experiment using sighting staffs and back sighting at the Strathnaver, so we're not going to talk about that just now. Got done. Folks, I think we're coming to the end um, of our session here. I could talk about Brocks for age, for, forever. They they're truly are fascinating. I mean, I lived in Caithness. I was brought up there until my 30s, so I was brought up in the shadow of Brocks. But these kind of passed me because when you're living surrounded with over 30 medieval castles, hundreds of ancient cairns, the brochs kind of were secondary to me. I was more into the, the, the pre-prehistory, the cairns, 
and the, the burial sites of the Neolithic era. But Brock history in Caithness is unique and I truly do believe that Caithness could firmly lodge itself on the tourist map just through Brock's alone, the Brock County. So I'm going to check and see if there's any more questions here, guys. And if not, I'm going to let you all go and get on with your Friday. And I'm going to get on with mine. Yeah, there's one more good question. Yeah, okay, so I can't actually answer this, but we'll discuss it. Why were Brock's only built in Scotland and not in England? That is a really, really tough question. So... That takes us back to the idea that rocks were built to defend from attack. Is there a chance that the original rocks in the south were built to defend from attacks from the English? It certainly raises that question. But I think we've got to look more at the landscape to answer that question. Why were rocks built in Scotland and not in England? I think it's because England is so flat compared to Scotland that long distance communication could be done without the assistance of rocks. Where you have glens, highlands, lowlands, rivers, mountains, being able to communicate around corners over distance, you do, you need to be raised, you need to be at an elevated position, a position that can be seen over distance. So I think it's environmental as to why they were, and there you go, built to keep the weather out too. That's the primary reason. This is all against weather, survival. It's all about survival. You survive against the weather, then we defend against other people. So absolutely, weather and environment is going to be the primary reason for a broch. And to back that up, we find about 500 AD, 500 BC, when in the Iron Age when the brochs were being built, there was a definite weather, a climate change. Things become a lot, lot wetter. So living outdoors in crudely built hut circles just wouldn't have cut it anymore. Stone built, hardcore places of residence were built to adjust for the changing weather. Now, Don, you've got another one. The stones are very white and many the shape of animals and birds all along the top end, both west and east, must be connected to pick the stones. Absolutely, 100% Don. The, the Pictish stones, if you like, Pict's a very broad um, historical category, but it really was the Picts that were building the brochs, if you like. And the symbology that we find in the Pictish stones, especially the eagle, the salmon, can be found on the not only the pottery that's recovered within Brocks, but as you say, you can almost see stylization around some of the doors. But after 2,000 years of weathering, it's really hard to tell what's a work of the creative imagination and what's actually a carved salmon. However, the Pictish stones with the range of, I think there's... 13 distinct symbols, then variations of each, are pretty much indicating family logos. These are families, and when you find an eagle, you find a salmon on the same stone together, it would indicate the union of two tribes, or the union of two local groups that had come together. You know, I didn't feature it in the documentary, but if you look at the piece that Ian and I are down on the River Barrydale looking, and I say to him, have you checked here for Pictish carvings or petroglyphs? There's actually a small carving on the wall there of what appears to be a salmon. I didn't pick it up because it wasn't part of the story and it was going to ruin the flow. But if you go there and pause it just before I say if you checked, just after I say if you checked for petroglyphs, you'll see what appears to be a carved salmon right there beside a salmon catchment pool that the Brock builders were using. Basically as a fish farm, a natural fish farm catchment area of half a meter with a river charging down it. So Don, I reckon that's a carved salmon, but I'd be loving to see if you could, if you noticed any animal shapes within the rocks, within either of the rocks that we were at. I love that you were interacting with the audience. Do you know what Lynette, I, I, you know I'm guilty of that. What happens is when you're doing a live anything and you're tasked with talking to yourself for 15 or 20 minutes, it gets quite hard. And what you do is you go and so introvert, mining knowledge and making sure you're clear and not sounding too Scottish so the rest of the world can understand. It's hard then to start interacting, but I'm getting better with it. So I am actually answering questions and getting to the crux of what you guys want to know about rather than what I want to tell you about. Everything was connected. Dania, I can totally agree with you there. 
especially in the ancient world. We think we're connected today. We're connected through a matrix of wires and telephone cables. Back then it was flags and horns, but we were connected. So each clan had a symbol. Absolutely, it's believed there were 13 Pictish tribes dawn throughout the course of Scotland. Each marked with a different symbol. Some used the V-rod, some used the, the, the um, uniting solar disks. There was eagles, we see serpents, and, and it's kind of accepted now that when you find the marriage of symbols, it was the, the coming together of the Pictish nations or Pictish groups. And um, that, yeah, so yeah, each Pictish tribe, if you like, had its own logo. So you might find that those tribes in the Perthshire that were living higher up in the hills or the mountains might have used the eagle. You'll find those that are in the lowlands in the north, the lowlands beyond the highlands, may have favoured the salmon or the serpent. Again, all indicative of the environmental influences around each clan. And they are clans, even back then, you know, family units is what these are. That's an interesting question. Where does the word cat come from? So cat, for Caithness, Catanesia, is um, traditionally believed to be the land of the Cati. The Cati were a Germanic tribe that were said to have come across, landed in Caithness, brought agriculture, brought seed, and founded our county. There's, there's something in that. There's no records, obviously, it's prehistory that the Cati arrived. But the promontory of the cat has been associated with Caithness for hundreds of years in legend, in written works, in historical works. It's, it's always been associated with the land of the cat. So there may be something that the tribe of the Cati, or the Catach as they're called, did come to Caithness. But there's always been indigenous people there. There's been lots of incoming tribes. We've been attacked for thousands, hundreds of years from the north. But in there, somewhere, there was a tribe of the cat or who identified with the cat in Caithness. So the cat, the catty of Caithness came from the Chata, Cati, or Catach tribe, which were supposedly Germanic. Why Caithness? Simple. Agriculture. You know, you've got the lowlands of Scotland is testing for agriculture, or sorry, that the, the highlands in the lowlands. But when you get up to Caithness and you hit those lowlands, you've got flat fields for 40 miles from the Scarabends to the north. It's an agricultural merry-go-round. It's so defendable, you've got, you can defend the entire county from the Scarabends looking south and from the coastlines. Caithness is a centre of agriculture that is unique in the world. It's actually unique in Great Britain. It, apart from the opposite end, Cornwall, the Cornovi coast, again, a wonderful area of agriculture. So we find is where agriculture lends itself um, best. The most battles are fought, the most wars are fought and lost, the most defensive structures are built, and that's why Caithness was fortified with brocks, castles, cairns. They're all there for the wheat. Wheat is everything. Did the clans have personal elders that were equivalent to shamans? They certainly did. Animistic cultures that placed, that put life into mountains, rivers, animals, bogs, plants, weather form weather formats they were all controlled with shamanic people within tribes shaman is not the actual word for a pictish um what's the word i think priest is closer to shaman and of course i don't mean priest of the christian church but i mean somebody who administers the religious rites of a community whereas a shaman really re re administers the religious rights of himself, and through that the community is affected. But the Pictish um, high priests, if you like, the evidence for those guys can be seen at the likes of the, the, the... There's, you know, going all the way back to the, the Neolithic, you find horn shapes at the ends of the cairns, which were quite obviously built as platforms for ritual worship, or in, as the bones were being interred in the cairns. 
We find the actual house itself, the Baroque itself, is representative of the universe. Like in South America, all the houses are built on circles. They have conical roofs. The, cent the fire at the centre. So these were many universes, if you like. The circle of the universe. The, the skies, the, the stars above. And then the burning, generating fire in the centre. So I think we could be looking at the same cosmology within the Brochs, whereby each Broch was a representation of the universe and they would have been controlled and the ritual aspects of the people would have been controlled definitely by a shamanic type person. The Druids were recorded by the Romans and you know once Anglesey was defeated in 84 AD the Druids ran north. The Druids were flushed north to the Western Isles to Orkney and Caithness became a last bastion of the Druids of Anglesey so the traditions of the Druids, shamans, were absolutely rife in the Broch time, between 500 BC and 400 AD. Absolutely. Ashley, has any investigations into the Stroga slide been found past Mori going more towards Durness? The answer to that, Don, is I don't have a clue. I'll get on to it. We'll talk about this next week. But if you want to send me some stuff, you've got my email address. You can do that. Okay, folks, so we're going to bring this to an end only because if these things go on for 15 or 20 minutes, we start to lose folk and we like to have good numbers. So thanks all for joining and um, I'm going to be back here next Friday with something super special. So keep an eye on Ancient Origins. Um, after this, really, we're going to post next week's feature as soon as this is finished. So we'll hopefully see you all here again next Friday, folks. And I hope you all get a chance to watch the Brock Project documentary. And please do go find the Caithness Brock Project on Facebook. Like them. Share it around. If you've got cash, throw it at it. And if not, just give them your support. A bunch of hard-working boys for no reward other than pure satisfaction. No financial reward. They're rebuilding a Brock in Caithness. I think we should all get behind it. It's an audacious act. It's brave, it's bold, and it's unique. So come on guys, Caithness Brock Project, get behind them. Over and out. <laughs>